Book One, Chapter Eight, Concert and the Tiger. I propose that she herself come to Moscow, and appear on TV. Just think, Anastasia, with your beauty, you could easily be a world-class fashion or photo magazine model. And at this point. I realized that she was no stranger to earthly matters. Like all women, she delighted in being a beauty. Anastasia burst out laughing. A world-class beauty, huh? <laughs> she echoed my question and then, like a child, began to frolic about, prancing through the glade like a model on a catwalk. I was amused at her imitation of a fashion model, placing one foot in front of the other and turn as she walked, showing off imaginary outfits. Finding myself getting into the act, I applauded and announced, and now ladies and gentlemen, your attention please, performing before you will be that magnificent gymnast second to none, that incomparable beauty, Anastasia. This announcement tickled her fancy even more. She ran out into the middle of the glade and executed an incredible flying somersault. First forward, then backward, then to the side, both left and right then an amazingly high leap into the air. Grasping a tree branch with one hand, she swung herself around it twice before flinging her body over to another tree. After yet another somersault, she began to bow coquittishly to my applause. She began to bow coquittishly to my applause. And she ran off out of the glade and hid behind some thick bushes. Anastasia peep, smiling out from behind them as though they were a theater curtain, and patiently awaiting my next announcement. I remembered a videotape I had of some of my favorite songs being performed by popular artists. I would watch it occasionally in the evening in my cabin aboard ship. I had this tape in mind, but not with the thought that Anastasia would actually be able to reproduce anything from it. As I announce, ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you the star singers of our current stage and a performance of their top hits. Your attention, please. Oh, how wrong I had been in my estimate of her abilities. What happened next, I could not possibly have predu predicted. No, not, no sooner had Anastasia made her entrance from behind her improvised curtains then she launched into the authentic voice of Ala Pagoshova. No, it wasn't just a parody or an imitation, but Ala herself effortlessly conveying not only her voice, but her annotations and emotions as well. But an even more amazing feature was to come. Anastasia accentuated particular words adding something of her own, infusing the song with her own supplemental intonations so that Ala Pokachova's own performance, which before it seemed nobody else could even begin to surpass, now called forth a whole new range of additional feelings, illuminating the images even more clearly and a magnificently executive overall performance of the song. Once live, 
an artist alone conveys this all through his home. He loved an actress, he thought. Flowers were her love, fresh grown. He went and sold his big home, sold every canvas he owned. And with the money, he bought a whole field of flowers, fresh grown. Anastasia put particular emphasis on the word canvas. She screamed out this word in fright and surprise. A canvas is an artist's most prized possession. Without it, he can no longer create. And here, he is giving up the most precious thing he owns for the sake of his loved one. Later, as she sang the words, then she went off on the train. Anastasia tenderly portrayed the artist in love, looking longly after the departing train, which was carrying off his loved one forever. She portrayed his pain, his despair, his perplexed state of mind. I was too shaken by everything I had seen and heard to applaud at the end of the song. Anastasia bowed, anticipating the applause and hearing none, launched into a new song with even more enthusiasm. She performed all of my favorite songs in the same order they had been recorded on the videotape. In every single song which I had heard so many times before was now even clearer and more meaningful in her redemption. Upon completing the last song on the tape, still hearing no applause, Anastasia retreated backstage, too dumbfounded to speak. I remained seated in silence, still feeling an extraordinary impression from what I had just witnessed. Then I jumped up, began applauding and cried. Terrific, Anastasia. Encore, bravo. All performers on stage. Anastasia gingerly stepped forth and gave a bow. I kept on shouting, Encore, bravo, clapping my hands and stamping my feet. She too livened up. She clapped her hands and cried, Encore. Does that mean again? Yes, again and again and again. You did it so marvelously, Anastasia. Better than the singers themselves. Even better than our top stars. I fell silent and began attentively studying Anastasia. I thought of how multifaceted her soul must be if she could infuse her singing performance with so many new, splendid, clear features. She too stood motionless, silently, and inquiringly looking at me. Anastasia, do you have any song of your own? Couldn't you sing something of your own? Something I haven't heard before? I could, but my song does not have any words. Would you still like to hear it? Please sing your song. Fine. And she started in singing her most unusual song. Anastasia first screamed like a newborn baby. Then her voice started sounding quiet, tender, and caressing. She stood beneath a tree. Her hands clasped to her breast. Her head bowed. It was like a lullaby, gently caressing a little one with her voice. Her voice spoke to him of something very tender. Her soft voice, amazingly pure, caused everything around to grow silent. The birds singing, the chirping of the crickets in the grass, 
At that point, Anastasia seemed to take absolute delight in the little one waking from sleep. The sound of rejoicing, rejoicing could be rejoicing could be heard in her voice. The incredible high pitched sounds soared above the earth before taking flight into the heights of infinity. Anastasia's voice first pleaded, then went into battle, and once again caressed the little one and bestowed joy upon all around. I too felt this all-pervading sense of joy, and when she finished her song, I joyfully exclaimed, And now, my dear ladies and gentlemen, a unique and never-to-be-repeated number by the top animal trainer in the world, the most agile, brave, charming trainer, trainer, capable of taming any beast of prey on earth. Behold and tremble. Anastasia positively positively squealed with delight, leaped into the air, clapped her hands in, ryth in rhythm, shouted something, started, started in whistling. Something I could never have imagined began taking place in the grave. First, that she-wolf made her entrance. She leapt out of the bushes and stopped at the edge of the glade, giving a puzzled look around. In the trees furthest from the glade, squirrels sprang from branch to branch. Two eagles circled low overhead while little creatures of some kind rustled in the bushes. With a sharp crackle of dry twigs, as he broke and crushed the brushes, a huge bear lumbered out into the glade and stopped, as though embedded in the ground, just short of Anastasia. The wolf began growling at him disapprovingly since the bear had approached so close to Anastasia without an invitation. Anastasia ran up to, to the bear playfully, stroking his muzzle, then grabbed, by him, then grabbed him by his front paws and stood him up right, judging by the fact that she didn't seem to be Exerting much physical effort in this, the bear himself must have been carrying out her commands according to how much he understood and how he interpreted them. He stood stock still trying to understand what was desired of him. Anastasia took a running leap and grabbing hold of the thick scruff of the bear's neck, did a handstand on his shoulders jumping off again with a somersault on her way down. Then she took the bear by one paw and started to bend over, pulling the bear after her, creating the impression that she was tossing him over her shoulder. This trick would have been impossible if the bear had not been able to do it himself. Anastasia simply guided him. It, took at it looked at first as though the bear was going to fall on Anastasia, but at the last moment, he reached out a paw to the ground and broke his fall. He was no doubt doing everything he could not to harm his mistress or friend. In the meantime, the wolf was become more and more concerned. She was already standing at the place of the action, thrashing from side to side, growling or howling with displeasure. At the edge of the glade, there appeared several more wolves, and when Anastasia was on the point of yet another routine toss of the bear over her shoulder, the bear attempted to do the trick properly, fell over on his side, and remained motionless. At last, the wolf, now at her wit's end, and with a malicious grin, made a leap in the bear's direction. With lighting speed, Anastasia placed herself in the wolf's path. The wolf braked with all four somersault over her back, bumping into Anastasia's leg. Immediately, Anastasia put one hand on the back of the wolf, who obediently crouched to the ground. 
With her other hand, she began waving as she had done that first time with me when I had tried to embrace her without her consent. The forest around us began to make a rustling sound, not threateningly, but with some agitation. The agitation was felt as well in all the big and little creatures jumping, running, and hiding. Anastasia began taking away the agitation. First, <clears throat> she stroked the wolf, slapped her on the back, and sent her off out of the glades as though she were a pet dog. The bear was still lying on his side in an uncomfortable pose like a falling scarecrow. He was probably waiting to see what else was required of him. Anastasia went over to him, made him stand up, stroked his muzzle, and sent him out of the gray like the wolf. Anastasia, blushing and cheerful, ran over and sat down beside me. Breathe in deeply and slowly exhale. I noticed that her breathing all at once became even as though she hadn't been carrying out an extraordinary exercise at all. They do not understand play acting, and they ought not to. It is not entirely a good thing, Anastasia remarked. And she asked me, well, how was I? Do you think I could find any kind of work in your life? You're terrific, Anastasia. But we already have all that in our circus. Trainers show us a lot of interesting tricks with animals. But you don't have a hope of breaking through all the red tape to even get started. There are so many information. There are so many formality and, and machinations to deal with. Machinations to deal with. You don't have any experience in that. The remainder, the remainder of our play consisted in going over possible alternatives. Where could Anastasia get a job in our world? And how would she overcome the formalities in the way? But no easy alternative presented itself. Since Anastasia had neither a resident permit, nor proof of education, and nobody would believe the stories about her origins and the basis of her abilities, no matter how extraordinary they might be. Suddenly, turning serious, Anastasia said, of course, of course, of course I would like to visit one of the big cities again, maybe Moscow, to see how accurate I was in visualizing certain situations from your life. For one thing, I am a complete loss to understand how the dark forces manage to fool women to such a degree that they unwittingly attract men with the charms of their bodies and thereby deprive them of the opportunity of making a real choice to choose someone close to their heart. And then they themselves suffer for not being able to create a real family sense. And once again, she launched into deep and poignant discussion about sex, family, and the upbringing of children. And I could only think, the most incredible thing in all I have seen and heard is her ability to talk about our lifestyle and understand it in such specific detail. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 9, Who Lights a New Star? On the second night, fearing that Anastasia would once again assign me her she-bear or concoct up some new device to keep me warm, I categorically refused to go to sleep at all unless she herself lay down beside me. I thought that as long as she was beside me, she wouldn't be up to any tricks. And I told her, You've invited me as a guest. I take it. In your home, I imagine there would be at least a few buildings here. But you won't even let me light a fire. And you offer me a beastie, a beastie, to keep me company at night. If you don't have a normal home, 
What's the point of inviting a guest? All right, Vladimir, do not worry. Please do not be afraid. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. If you want, I shall lie down beside you and keep you warm. This time, in the dugout cave, there were even more cedar branches strewn around along with, with neatly arranged dry grasses. And there were also branches stuck on the wall. I got undressed. I put my sweater and trouser under my head for a pillow. I lay down and covered myself with my jacket. The cedar twigs gave off that same bacteria killing aroma described in the popular literature as capable of purifying the air. Though there in the taiga the air is already so pure, the air in the cave was particularly easy to breathe. The dry grasses and flowers contributed a still more unusual delicate fragrance. Anastasia kept her word and lay down beside me. I sensed the fragrance of her body, which surpassed all other odors. It was more pleasant than the most delicate perfume I had ever sensed from a woman's body. But now I had no thought of wanting to possess her. After my attempt to do so on the way to the glade, which had resulted at the time in an attack of fear and loss of consciousness, I no longer felt aroused by fleshly desires, even when I saw her naked. I lay down and dreamt of the sun my wife never bore to me, and I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if my son could be born by Anastasia? She is so healthy, sturdy, and beautiful. The child then too would be healthy. He would look like me, like her too, but more like me. He would be a strong and clever individual. He would know a lot. He would become talented and prosper. I imagine our infant son sucking at his mother's nipple and involuntarily put my hand on Anastasia's warm, supple breast. Immediately, a shiver ran through my whole body and then dissipated at once. But it wasn't a shiver of fear, but something else extraordinarily pleasing. I didn't take my hand away but only held my breath and waited for what might happen. Next thing I noticed was the feeling of the soft palm of her hand on mine. She did not push me away. I raised my head at, I raised my head and began looking into Anastasia's marvelous face. The white twilight of the northern night made it seem very made it seem even more attractive. I couldn't take my gaze off her. Her grayish blue eyes looked at me tenderly. I didn't restrain myself, but bent closer and quickly and carefully with just the slightest touch, planted a kiss on her half open lips. Once more, a pleasing shiver ran through my body. My face was enshrouded with the fragrance of her breath. Her lips didn't utter, as the last time, do not do this, calm down. And I had no fear at all. I still was hunted by this pros prospect of a son. And when, a, and when Anastasia tenderly embraced me, stroked my hair and gave her whole body to me, I felt something indescribable. Only upon awakening in the morning was I able to realize that this kind of magnificent feeling, blissful excitement and satisfaction was something I had never once experienced in my entire life. Another peculiar thing, after a night spent with a woman, I had always felt a sense of physical fatigue, but here everything was different. In addition, 
I had the feeling of some kind of great co-creation. My satisfaction wasn't just something physical, but had another dimension. I couldn't cut quite comprehend one I had never experienced before. Extraordinary, lovely, and joyful. The thought even flashed through my mind that life was worth living just for this feeling alone. And why had I never experienced anything that even came close to this before? Even though there had been all sorts of women, beautiful women, beloved women, women experienced in love. Anastasia was, Anastasia was a girl, a tender, quivering girl. But beyond that, there was nothing in that belong. There was nothing in her that belonged not to a single woman I had known. What was it? And where had she gone now? I made my way over to the entrance of the cozy dog out cave, poked my head out, and looked out into the glade. The glade was situated at a slightly lower level than my nighttime resting place. It was covered by a layer of morning mist, a half meter thick. In this mist, I could see Anastasia spinning around with outstretched arms. A little cloud of mist was forming about her. And when it covered her completely, Anastasia sprang easily into the air, stretched out her legs and a split just like a ballerina flew over the layer of, of mist, landed in a different spot and once more laughing, spun a new cloud around her through which could be seen the rays of the rising sun. Gently caressing her body, it was a charming and delightful scene and I cried out with an overflow of emotion. Anastasia, good morning, my splendid forest fairy, Anastasia, <laughs> yeah. Good morning, Vladimir, she joyfully called out in response. It's so delightful, so wonderful out right now. Why is it that? I cried out as loud as I could. Anastasia lifted up her hands toward the sun and began laughing with that happy, alluring laugh of hers, calling out to me and someone else besides, high above, in a sing-song voice. Out of all the creatures in the universe, only man is giving an experience like that. Only man and, and woman sincerely desiring to have a child between them. Only men having such an experience lights a new star in the heavens. Only man striving for creation and co-creation. Thank you. And addressing me alone, she quickly added, only men striving for creation and co-creation and not for satisfaction of his carnal needs. And again, she went off in trills of laughter, leapt high into the air, stretched her legs into a split as though soaring over the, the mist. Then she came running over, sat down beside me at the entrance to our nighttime resting place and began combing her god goading tresses with her fingers, lifting them up from the bottom. So you don't consider sex to do to be something sinful, I asked. Anastasia fell silent. She looked at me in amazement and responded. Was that the same kind of sex the word implies in your world? And if not, then what is more sinful to give off yourself so that a man can come into the world or to hold back and not allow a man to be born, a real man? I started thinking, in actual fact, my nighttime closeness with Anastasia could not possibly be described by our usual world word. 
sex, then what did happen last night? What term would be appropriate here? Again, I asked. And why did anything even approaching that experience never happen with me before? Or for that matter, I would venture to say with hardly anybody else in the world. You see, Vladimir, the dark forces are constantly trying to make man give in to base fleshly passions to stop him from experiencing God-given grace. They try all sorts of tricks to persuade people that, is, that satisfaction is something you can easily obtain, thinking only of carnal desire. And at the same time, they separate man from truth. The poor deceived women who are ignorant of this spend their living, their lives accepting nothing but suffering and searching for the grace they have lost. But they are searching for it in the wrong place. No woman can restrain a man from fornication if she allows herself to submit to him merely to satisfy his carnal needs. If that has happened, their marital life will not be a happy one. Their marital life the marital life is only an illusion of togetherness, a lie, a deception accepted by convention. For the woman immediately becomes a fornicator regardless of whether she is married to the man or not. Oh, how many laws and conventions mankind has invented in an attempt to artificially strengthen this false union laws both religious and secular all in vain all they have done is cause people to play around accommodate themselves and imagine that such a union exists one's innermost thoughts invariably remain unchanged subject to nobody and nothing christ jesus saw this and trying to counteract it, he said, Anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery, adultery with her in his heart. Then you and your not-so-distant past have tried to attach shame to anyone who leaves his family. But nothing at any time or in any situation has been able to stop man's desire to seek out that sense of intuitively felt grace, the greatest satisfaction, and to persist in seeking it. A false union is a frightening thing. Children, do you see Vladimir? Children, they sense the artificiality, the falsity, of such a union, and this makes them skeptical about everything their parents tell them. Children subconsciously sense the lie even during their conception, and that has a bad effect on them. Tell me who, what individual would want to come into the world as a result of carnal pleasures alone? We would all like to be created under great impulsion of love. The aspiration to creation itself and not simply come into the world as a result of someone's carnal pleasure. People who have come into a false union, union will then look for true satisfaction in secret, apart from each other. They will strive to possess body after body or make poultry in faithful use of their own bodies realizing only intuitively that they are drifting farther and farther away from the true happiness of a true union. Anastasia, wait. I said, can't it be that men and women are doomed this way if the first time all that happens between them is sex? 
Is there no turning back, no possibility of correcting the situation? There is. I now know what to do, but where do I find the right words to express it? I'm always looking for them, the right words. I have been looking for them in the past and in the future, but I have not found them. Perhaps they are right in front of me after all, and then they will appear. New words will be born, words capable of reaching people's hearts and minds. New words for the ancient truth about their primal origins. Don't panic, Anastasia. Use existing, existing words to start with, just as in an approximation. What else is needed for true satisfaction apart from two bodies? Complete awareness. A mutual striving to create sincerity and purity of motive. How do you know all this, Anastasia? I am not the only one who knows about it. A number of, of enlightened people have tried to explain it to the world. Vels, Krishna, Rama, Shiva, Christ, Muhammad, Buddha. You've what? You read about all these people? Where? When? I have not read about them. I simply know what they said, what they thought about, what they wanted to accomplish. So sex by itself, according to you, is bad? Very bad. It leads men away from truth, destroys families, an enormous amount of energy is wasted. Then why, why do so many different magazines publish pictures of naked women and erotic poses? Why are there so many films with erotica and sex? And all of this is extremely popular. Demand generates supply. So you're trying to say that our humanity is completely bad? Humanity is not bad, but the devices of the dark forces of securing spirituality by provoking base carnal desires. These are very powerful devices. They bring people a lot of grief and suffering. They act through women, exploiting their beauty, a beauty whose real purpose is to engender and support in men, the spirit of the poet, the artist, the creator. But to do, but to do that, women themselves must be pure. If there is not sufficient purity, they start trying to attract men by fleshly charms. The outward beauty of empty vessels. In the upshot, the men are deceived and the women must suffer their whole lives on account of this deception. So what, then, is the result I crude? Through all the millennia of their existence, mankind has not been able to overcome these devices of the dark forces. That would mean they are stronger than man. Man hasn't been able to overcome them in spite of the appeals by spiritually enlightened people, as you put it. So it is downright impossible to overcome them, or maybe it's not necessary. It is necessary, absolutely necessary. Who then can do it? Women. Women who have been able to grasp the truth in their own appointed purpose, then the men will change too. Oh no, Anastasia, I doubt it. A normal man will always be aroused, aroused by a pretty woman's legs, her breasts, especially when you're on a business trip or on holiday far away from your partner. That's the way things are. And nobody here will change anything. They won't do it any other way. But I did it with you. What did you do? Now you are no longer able to indulge in that harmful sex. All at once, a terrible thought hit me like a flood and started chasing away the, the magnificent feeling that had been born in me during the night. 
what have you done, Anastasia? What? I'm now what? I'm now impotent? On the contrary, you have now become a real man. Only the usual sex will be repugnant to you. It does not bring what you experienced last night. And what, and what you experienced last night is, in, is possible only when you desire to have a child. And the woman wants the same from you. And she loves you. Loves, but under those conditions, that can happen only a few times during one's whole life. I assure you, Vladimir, that is enough for your whole life to be happy. You will feel the same way eventually. People enter many times a fresh intersexual interaction only through the flesh, not realizing that true satisfaction in the flesh is impossible to attain. A man and a woman who unite on every plane of existence, impelled by radiant inspiration, earnestly aspiring to the act of creation, experienced tremendous satisfaction. The Creator gave this, gave this experience to men alone. No, transis, no transitory thing, the satisfaction. No. It never even, it never can compare with fleeting a flesh and gratification. As you cherish the feelings from it over time, all planes of being will, with influence, sublime happy, happy, happy fire your life and the woman too. A woman who can give birth to a creation in the creator's own image and likeness, his design. Anastasia held out her hand toward me, trying to move closer. I quickly darted away from her into a corner of the cave and cried. Out of my way, she got up. I crawled outside and backed off from her a few steps. You have deprived me, quite possibly, of my chief pleasure in life. Everybody strives for it. Everybody thinks about it. Only they don't talk about it out loud. They are illusion, Vladimir. These pleasures of yours, I have helped save you from a terrible, harmful, and sinful appetite. Illusion or not doesn't make any difference. It's a, pl it's, it's a pleasure recognized by everyone. Don't even think of trying to save me from, my, from any other harmful appetites as you see them. Or well, by the time I get out of here, I'll be... No relations with women, no drinks or appetizers, no smoking. That's not something most people are used to in normal life. Well, what good is there in drinking, smoking, senseless and harmful digestion of such a huge quantity of animal meat when there are so many splendid plants created, especially for man's nourishment? You go and feed yourself with plants if you like, but don't come near me. A lot of us get pleasure out of smoking, drinking, sitting down to a good meal. That's how we do things. Do you understand? That's how. But everything you name is bad and harmful. Bad, harmful. If guests come to celebrate at my place and they sit down at the table, and I tell them, here are some nuts to now on. Have an apple, drink water, and don't smoke. Now that would be bad. Is that the most important thing when you get together with friends? To sit right down at the table and drink, eat, and smoke? Whether it's the most important thing or not is beside the point. That's how people behave all over the world. Some countries even have ritual dishes. Roast turkey, for example. That is not accepted by everyone, even in your world. Maybe not by everyone, but I happen to live among normal people. Why do you consider the people around you to be the most normal? 
because they're in the majority, that is not a good enough argument. It's not good enough for you because it's something impossible to explain to you. My anger at Anastasia began to pass. I recall hearing about medical prescriptions and sex therapies and the thought came to me that if she had somehow injured me, the doctors would be able to fix it. I said, okay, Anastasia, let's make peace. I'm no longer angry at you. I thank you for the wonderful night. Only don't you try saving me from any more of my habits. As for as sex goes, I'll fix the situation with the help of our doctors and modern medicines. Let's go for a swim. I begin heading for the lake, admiring the morning um, woods, just as my good mood was beginning to come back. She well there. She well there you go again. Walking behind me, she piped up. Medicines and doctors will not help you now. To put everything back the way it was, they will have to erase your memory of everything that happened and everything you felt. Stunned, I stopped in my tracks. Then you put everything back the way it was. I cannot. Again, I was overwhelmed by a feeling of rampant rage and at the same time fear. You, you brazen, you poke your nose in where it doesn't belong and turn my life upside down. So you played a nasty trick on me and now you say you can't fix it. I did not play any nasty tricks. After all, you wanted a son so badly, but, but, but so many years had gone by and you still did not have a son. And none of the women in your life would bear you a son. I also wanted a child by you, a son too. And that is something I can do. And why are you getting so concerned a bit of time that things are going to go badly for you? Maybe you're still come to understand. Please do not be afraid of me, Vladimir. I am certainly not trying to meddle with your mind. This happened all on its own. You got what you wanted. And I would still very much like to save you from at least one mortal sin. And what's that? Pride. You're funny one. Your philosophy and lifestyle aren't human. What do you find in me so inhuman that it frightens you? You live all alone in the forest and communicate with plants and animals. Nobody in our society even comes close to that kind of life. How can that be, Vladimir? Why? Anastasia exclaimed, flustered. Your Dutchniks, your Dutchniks, they too communicate with plants and animals. Only not consciously, but they will understand one day. Many have already begun to understand. Oh, come on. Now she's a Dutchnik? And this ray of yours, you know, a lot. But you don't read books. You must be some kind of mystic. I should try to explain everything to you, Vladimir, only not all at once. I am trying, but I cannot find the right words. Comprehensible words. Please believe me. All my abilities are inherited in man. It is something man was giving right from the start, back in the days of his primal origin. And everyone could do the same today. Nevertheless, people are starting to go back to their primal origin origin. It will be a gradual process after the forces of light triumph. What about your concert? You sung in all sorts of different voices. You portrayed my favorite artists and even in the same order as on, my, as on my videotape. That is right, Vladimir. You know, I once saw that tape of yours. I shall tell you later how it happened. And what you write and what you write off, off memorize the words and tunes of all the songs. Yes, I memorize them. What is so complex or mystical about that? Oh dear, what have I gone and done? I have talked too much. I have shown too much. 
I am muddled headed and tactless. My grandfather once called me that. I thought he was just being affectionate, but in fact, I probably am tactless. Please, Vladimir. Anastasia's voice betrayed a very human concern, and this was probably the reason that almost all my fear of her had now left me. My whole feelings were preoccupied with the prospect of my son. Okay, I'm no longer afraid. Only please try to be a bit more restrained. Remember your grandfather told you that. Yes, and grandfather, but here I am talking and talking. I have such a strong desire to tell you everything. Am I a chatterbox? Yes, but I shall try. I should try very hard to restrain myself. I should try to speak only in terms you will understand. So you'll soon be giving birth, Anastasia. I said, of course. Only it will not be on time. What do you mean it will not be on time? Ideally, it should be in the summertime when nature can help with the nurturing. Why did you make that decision? If it's so risky for you and your child. Do not worry, Vladimir. At least our son will live. And you and I should try to hold on till the spring. And everything will adjust itself then. Anastasia said this without a ting of sorrow or fear for her life. Then she ran off and jumped into the little lake. The spray of the water and the, su and the sunlight took flight. Just like fireworks and landed on the smooth mirror like surface of the water some 30 seconds later her body slowly began to break the surface she lay as it were on the water her arms widespread her palms upturned and smiled i stood on the shore looked at her and thought to myself well the Squirrel here, the snap of her fingers when she lies with her baby in one of her shelters? Will she get help from any of her four-footed friends? Will her body have enough heat to warm up the little one? If my body should cool off and the baby have nothing to eat, he will start crying, she said quietly, coming out of the water. His cry of despair made waking nature or at least part of it before the beginning of spring and then everything would be all right they will nurse him you read my thoughts no i just guess you were thinking about that that is quite natural anastasia you said your relatives live close by Would they be able to help you they are very busy and i must not take them away from their work what are they busy with, Anastasia? What do you do all day long when in fact you are so completely served by your natural environment? I keep busy and I try to help people in your world, the ones you call Dachniks or gardeners. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 10 Her Beloved Dachniks Anastasia enthusiastically exclaimed, explained to me how many new opportunities could open up for people who communicate with plants. There were two major subjects she talked about, not only with particular excitement and animation, but I would have to admit with a kind of love, namely bringing up children on the one hand and Dachniks on the other. According to everything she said about these people and the importance she attached to them, we would all need to literally bow on our knees before them. Just think, according to her, the, Dach the Dachniks have not only managed to save the whole nation from famine, from famine but also sown seeds of good in people's hearts and are educating the society of the future. There are far too many points to enumerate here. One would need a whole book 
and Anastasia kept on arguing, trying to demonstrate this. You see, the society you are living in today can learn a lot from communication with the plants to be found around Dach Dachas. Yes, I am talking about the Duchess, where you personally know every individual plant in your garden plot, and not those huge impersonal fields cultivated by monstrous, senseless machines. People feel better when they are working in their dacha plots. Many of them end up living longer. They become kinder. And it is this very dachnik that can pave the way for society to become aware of how destructive the technocratic path can be. Anastasia, whether that's true or not is, for the time being, besides the point. What is your role in all of this? What kind of help can you offer? Taking me by the arm, she led me over to the grass. We lay on our backs. The palms of our hands turn upward. Close your eyes. Let's go and try to picture to yourself what I am saying. Right now, I shall take a look with my ray and locate at a distance some of those people you call Dachniks. After a period of silence, she began to say softly, an old woman is unwrapping a piece of cheesecloth in which cucumber seeds have been soaking. The seeds have already begun to develop square, have already begun to develop quite a bit. And I can see little sprouts. Now she has picked up a seed. I have just suggested to her that she should not soak the seeds so much. They will, they will become deformed when they are planted. And this kind of water is not good for them. The seed will go bad. She thinks she herself must have guessed that. And that is partially true. I just help her guess a bit. Now she will share her idea and tell other people about it. This little deed is done. Anastasia told me how she visualized in her consciousness all sorts of situation involving work, recreation, and people's interaction, both with each other and with plants. When the situation she has visualized comes closer to reality, contacts is established whereby she can see the person and feel what this person is suffering or sensing. She herself then as it were, steps into the image of the person and shares her expertise with them. Anastasia said that plants react to people, to man with love or hate, and exercise a positive or negative influence on people's health. And here is where I have an enormous amount of work to do. I keep myself busy with the Jacha garden plots. The Dutchniks travel out to their plots their plantings, they are like their own children, but unfortunately, their relationship to them is still pretty much on the level of intuition. They still do not have the foundation that comes with a clear realization of the true purpose behind this relationship. Everything but everything on earth, every blades of grass, Every insect has been created for man, and everything has its undivided appointed task to perform in the service of men. The multitude of medicinal plants are a confirmation of this. But people in your world know very little about how to benefit from the opportunities they are presented with, about how to take full advantage of them. I ask Anastasia to show some concrete example of the benefits of conscious communication. 
an example that could be seen, verified, and practiced, and subject to scientific investigation. Anastasia th thought for a little while, then suddenly brightened and exclaimed, The Dutchniks, my beloved Dutchnik, they will prove it all. They will show what is true and confound all your science. Now, how is it? I did not think of that or understand it before. Some kind of brand new idea made her bubble over with joy. The whole time I was with her, not once did I see Anastasia sad. She can be serious, thoughtful, and concentrate, but more often than not, delighting in something. This time her joy literally bubbled over. She jumped up and clapped her hands, and it seemed to me as though the whole forest had become brighter and began to stir, responding to her the rust with the rustling of treetops and the singing of birds. She whirled round and round as though she were doing a kind of dance. Then all radiant, she once again sat down beside me and said, now they will believe, all on account of them, my dear. Dutch next, they will explain and prove everything. Trying to bring her a little more quickly back to the topic of our interrupted conversation, I noted, not necessarily. You say that every insect has been created for man's benefit. But how can people believe that when they look with so much loading on the cockroach crawling over the kitchen tables? What can it be that they too have been created for a benefit? Cockroaches, declared Anastasia, will only crawl over a dirty table to collect the remains of any food particles lying about particles too small for the human eye to see. They process them and render them harmless before discarding them in some, some, in some secluded spot. If there are so many of them, simply bring a frog into the house and the surplus cockroaches will disappear at once. What Anastasia went on to propose the Dutchniks do well probably contradict the principles of the plant science and will certainly contradict the commonly accepted methods of planting and cultivating various garden plant crops. Her affirmations, however, are so col collagial that it seems to me they will be worth trying out for anyone with the opportunity to do so. Maybe not throughout their whole plot, but at least in one small section of it, especially since nothing harmful and only good could come off, come off of it. Besides, much of what she told me has already been confirmed by the experiments of the biological science expert, Mikhail Prokhorov. Anastasia, book one, chapter 11, Advice from Anastasia The Seed as Physician Anastasia stated, Every seed you plant contains within itself an enormous amount of information about the universe. Nothing made by human hands can compare with this information either in size or accuracy. Through the help of these da data, the seed knows the exact time down to the millisecond when it is to come alive, grow, what juices it is to take from the earth, how to make use of the rays of the celestial bodies, the sun, moon, and stars. What is it to grow into? What fruit to bring forth? These fruits are designed to sustain man's life. More powerful and effectively 
than any manufactured drugs of the present or future. These fruits are capable of counteracting and withstanding any disease of the human body. But to this end, the seed must know about the human condition. So that during the maturation process, it can, satu it can saturate its fruit with the right correlation of substance to heal a specific individual of his disease. If indeed he has it or is prone to it, in order for the seed of a cucumber, tomato, or any other plant grown in one's plot to have such information, the following steps are necessary. Before planting, put into your mouth one or more little seeds. Hold them in your mouth, under the tongue, for at least nine minutes. Then place the seed between the palms of your hands and hold it there for about 30 seconds. During this time, it is important that you be standing barefoot on the spot of earth where you will later be planting it. Open your hands and carefully raise the seed which you are holding to your mouth. Then blow on it lightly, warming it with your breath. And the wee little seed will know everything that is within you. Then you need to hold it with your hands. Open another 30 sec seconds, presenting the seed to the celestial bodies. And the seed will determine the moment of its awakening. The planets will all help it and will give the sprouts the light. They need to produce fruit, especially for you. After that, you may plant the seed in the ground and no case should you water it right off, so as not to wash away the saliva, which is now covering it, along with other information about you that the seed will take in. It can be watered three days after planting. The planting must be done on days appropriate, appropriate to each vegetable. People already know this from the lunar calendar. And the absence of watering a premature planting is not as harmful as an overdue planting. It's not a good idea to pull up all the weeds growing in the vicinity of the sprouts. At least one of each kind should be left in place. The weeds can be cut back. According to Anastasia, the seed is thus able to take in information about the person who plants it and then during the cultivation of its fruits it will pick up from the universe and the earth the optimum blend of energies needed for a given man. The weed, the weed should not dispose off completely as, he, as they have their own appointed function. Some weeds serve to protect the plant from disease while others give supplement supplemental information. During the cultivation time, it is vital to communicate with the plant at least once during its growth period. And it is desirable to approach it and touch it during a full moon. Anastasia maintains that the fruit cultivated from the seed in this manner and consumed by the individual who cultivated is capable not only of curing him of any disease of the flesh whatsoever, but also of significantly retarding the aging process, rescuing him from harmful habits, tremendously increasing his mental abilities, and giving him a sense of inner peace. The fruit will have the most effective influence when consumed no later than three days after harvesting. The above mentioned steps should be taken 
with a variety of plant species in the garden plot. It is not necessary to plant a whole row of cucumbers, tomatoes, etc. In this manner, just a few plants each is enough. The fruit of plants grown like this will be distinguished from other plants of the same species, not only in taste. If analyzed, it will be seen that they are also distinct in terms of the substance they contain. When planting the seedings, it is important to soften the dirt in the excavated hole with one's fingers and bare toes and spit into the hole. Responding to my question, why the feet? Anastasia explained that through pers pers perspiration from one's feet comes substances, toxins no doubt, containing information about bodily disease. This information is taken in by the seedlings. They transmit it to the fruit, which will thus be enabled to counteract diseases. Anastasia recommend walking around the plot barefoot from time to time. What kind of plants should one cultivate? Anastasia replied. The same variety that exists in most garden plots is quite sufficient. Raspberries, currants, gooseberries, cucumbers, tomatoes, tomatoes, white strawberries, any kind of apple tree. Sweet or sour cherries and flowers would be very good too. It does not make any difference how many plants of each kind there are or how big their area of cultivation is. There are a few definites. Without which, it, without which it would be difficult to imagine a full energy microclimate. One of them is sunflowers, at least one plant. There should also be one and a half or two square meters of cereal grains, rye or wheat, for example. And be sure to leave an island of at least two square meters for wild growing herbs ones that are not planted manually. If you have not left any of them growing around your dacha, you can bring in some turf from the forest and thereby create an island of natural growth. I ask Anastasia, if it were necessary to plant these definites directly in the plot, if there were already some wild growing herbs close by, say just beyond the fence and this is how she responded it is not just a variety of plants that is significant but how but also how they are planted the direct communication with them that allows them to take in the information they need I have already told you about one of the methods of planting that is the basic one the important thing is to infuse the little patch of nature surrounding you with information about yourself. Only then will the healing effect and the life-giving support of your body be significantly higher than from the fruit alone. Out in the natural wild, as you call them, and nature really is not wild, it is just unfamiliar to you. There are a great many plants that can help us cure all and I mean all existing diseases. These plants have been designed for that purpose, but man has lost or almost lost the ability to identify them. I told Anastasia that we already have many specialists, pharma pharmacies which deal in healing herbs, just as there are many physicians and medicine men who make a profession out of herb treatments, and she replied, chief physician is your own body. Right from the start, it was endowed with the ability to know which herb should be used and when, how to eat and breathe. It is capable of warding off disease even before its outward manifestation. And nobody else can replace your body, for this is your personal physician, 
given individually to you by God and personal only to you. I am telling you how to provide it with the opportunity to act beneficially on your behalf. If you make connection with the plants in your garden plot, they will take care of you and cure you. They will make the right diagnosis all by themselves and prepare the most effective medicine especially designed for you. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 11 Advice from Anastasia Who gets stung by these? In every garden plot, there should be at least one colony of bees. I told Anastasia, there are very few people in our society who can communicate with bees. Special training is required and not everyone is successful. But she replied, a lot of what you do to maintain bee colonies just gets in the way. Over the past centuries, there have been only two people on earth who have come close to understanding this unique life form. And who might they be? They are two monks who have since been canonized. You can read about them in your books. They can be found in many monastery archives. Come on now, Anastasia. You read church literature too? Where, when? You don't even have a single book. I have at my disposal a much more complete method of retrieving information. What kind of method? Again, you're talking in circles. After all, you promised me you wouldn't resort to any mysticism or fantasy. I should tell you about it. I shall even try teaching it to you. You will not understand it right away but it is simple and natural. Well, okay. So how should bees be kept on a garden plot? All you have to do is build the same kind of hive for them. They would have under natural condition. And that is it. After that, the only thing required is to go to the hive and gather part of the honey, wax, and other substance they produce. That are, that are so useful for men. Anastasia, that's not simple at all. Who knows what that natural hive should look like? Now, if you could tell me how to do it myself with the materials we have at our disposal, then that might be something feasible. <laughs> all right, she laughed. Then you will have to wait a bit. I need to visualize it. I have to see what people in today's world might have to, on hand, as you say, and where should it be placed so as not to spoil the view, I added. I should look into that too. She lay down on the grass, as she always did, visualizing her, or rather our living situation. But this time, I begin to observe her carefully. As she lay on the grass, her arms were stretched out in different directions, with palms upturned, her fingers partly curled, and their tips, especially the tips of the four fingers on each hand, were also positioned so that their soft parts face upward. Her fingers first began to stir a little, but then stopped. Her eyes were closed. Her body was completely relaxed. Her face too appeared relaxed at first, but then a faint shadow of some kind, a feeling of sensation move across, move across, across it. Later on, she explained how seeing at a distance could be practiced by anyone with a particular kind of upbringing. About the beehive, Anastasia had the following to say. You need to make the hive in the shape of a hollow block. 
you can either take a log with a hole in it and hollow it out to enlarge the cav cavity or use boards from a deciduous tree to make a long hollow box 120 centimeters long. The board should be no less than 6 centimeters thick. In the inside measurements of the cavity, at least 40 by 40 centimeters. Triangular stripe should be inserted into the corners where the inner surface meet to make the cavity somewhat rounded. The stripes can be just lightly glued in place and the bees themselves will firm them up afterward. One end, should, one end should be fully covered with a board of the same thickness with a hinge panel at the other end. For this, the panel needs to be cut in such a way so that it fits neatly into the opening and sealed with grass or some kind of cloth covering the whole bottom. Make a slit or a series of slits to provide access for the bees. Along the bottom edge of one of the sides approximately one and a half centimeters wide, starting 30 centimeters from the hinge opening and continuing to the other end. This hive can be set on pilings anywhere in the garden plot at least 20 to 25 centimeters off the ground with the slits facing south. It is even better, however, to set it up under the roof of the house. Then people will not interfere with the bees flying out and will not be bothered by them. In this case, the hive should be aligned horizontal at a 20 to 30 degree angle with the opening at the lower end. The hive could even be installed in the attic, provided there is proper ventilation or in the roof itself. Best of all, though, attach it to the south wall of the house, just under the cat, the eaves. The only thing is you need to make sure you have the proper, you have proper access to the hive so you can remove the honeycomb Otherwise, the hive should stand on a small platform with an overhead canopy to protect it from the sun and can be wrapped with insulation in winter. I remarked to Anastasia that this type of hive could be rather heavy and the platform and canopy might spoil the appearance of the house. What to do in that case? She looked at me a little surprised and then explained. The thing is that your beekeepers do not really go about it the right way. My grandfather told me about this. Beekeepers today have concocted a lot of different ways of constructing a hive, but all of them involve constant human intervention and its operation. They move the honeycomb frames around within the hive or move both the hive and the bees to a different spot for the winter. And that is something they should not do. Bees built their own, bees, bees built their honeycombs at a specific distance apart to facilitate both ventilation and defense against their enemies. And any human intervention breaks down the system. Instead of spending their time gathering honey and raising offspring, the bees are obliged to fix what has been broken. Under natural conditions, bees live in tree hollows and cope with any situation perfectly well on their own. I told you that they should be kept under conditions as close to their natural ones as possible. Their presence is extremely beneficial. They pollinate all the plants much more effectively than other agent, thereby increasing the yields. But you must know this pretty well already. What you may, what you may not know is that bees' mouths open up channels in the plants 
through which the plant takes in supplemental information reflected by the plants. Information the plants and subsequently human beings require. But bees sting people, don't you see? How can somebody get a good rest at a dacha if they're constantly afraid of being stung? Bees only sting when people act aggressively toward them. Wave them off, become afraid or irritate inside. Not necessarily at the bees, but just at anyone. The bees feel this and will not tolerate the rays of any dark feeling, any dark feelings. Besides, they may attack those parts of the body where there are channels connecting with some disease, internal organ, or where the protection aura has been torn and so forth. You know that bees are already effectively using. You know that bees are already effectively used in treating the disease you call radiocults. Tease. But that is far from being the only thing you can do. Only thing they can do. If I were to tell you about everything, especially showing the evidence you are asking for, you would have to spend not just three days, but many weeks with me. There is a lot written about bees in your will. All I have done is introduce a few correct correctives. But please, believe me, they are extremely important correctives. To establish a colony, colony of bees in a hive, like, that is very easy. Before introducing a swarm of bees into the hive, put in a little chunk of wax and some honey plant. You do not need to put in any handmade frames or cells. Afterward, when there are colonies established and even a few neighboring dacha plots, the bees will multiply all by themselves. Then as they swarm, they will occupy the empty hives. And how should the honey be gathered? Open the panel, break off the hanging honeycomb, and extract the seal honey and pollen. Only do not be greedy. It is important to leave part of it for the bees for the winter. In fact, it is better not to collect any honey at all during the first year. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 11 Advice from Anastasia Hello, morning. Anastasia has adapted her morning routine to the conditions of the dacha plot. In the morning, preferably at sunrise, walk out to the garden plot barefoot and approach any plants you like. You can touch them. This does not have to be done in in accord with some sort of schedule or ritual to be strictly followed day after day but simply as one feels moved or as one desires. But it should be done before washing. Then the plants will sense the fragrance of the substance emitted by the body through the pores of the skin during sleep. If it is warm and there is a small grassy patch close by and it would be helpful if there were, Lie down there and stretch out for three or four minutes. And if some little bug should happen to crawl into your body during this time, do not chase it away. Many bugs open up pores on the human body and cleanse them. As a rule, they open up the pores through which toxins are expelled and all sorts of internal alignments elements are brought to the surface, allowing the person to wash them away. If there is any pond water on the plot, you should immerse yourself in it. If not, then you can pour water over yourself as you stand barefoot close to the plants and seed beds, or even better, between the beds, or for example, one morning alongside the raspberry bushes, the next by the currant bushes, etc. 
and after washing you should not dry off right away. You should shake off the water drops from your hands, spreading them onto the surrounding plants and use your hands to brush off the water from other plants of your body. After this, you can go through the usual procedures of washing and using any conveniences to which you are accustomed. Anastasia, book one, chapter 11, advice from Anastasia. Evening routine. And the evening before going to bed, it is important to wash your feet using water with the addition of a small quantity, a few drops of juice from salt bush or nettles, or the two together, but no soap or shampoo. After washing your feet, pour the water onto the seed beds. Then if necessary, you can still wash your feet with soap. This evening routine is important for two reasons. As the feet perspire, perspire, toxins come to the surface, removing internal disease from the body. And this must be washed away to cleanse the pores. Juices from salt bush or nettles are good at facilitating this process. process. In pouring the remaining water onto the seed beds, you are giving supplemental information to the plants and microorganisms about your current state of well-being. This is very important too. Only after receiving this information can our visible and invisible environment work out and pick up from the universe and the earth everything it needs for the normal functioning of your body. Anastasia, book one, chapter 11, advice from Anastasia. It will prepare everything by itself. I was still interested in knowing what Anastasia had to say about food. After all, she has a rather unique dietary regime. And so I asked, Anastasia, tell me how you think a person should feed himself. What should he eat? How often during the day? And in what amounts? Our world pays a great deal of attention to this question. That's a huge quantity of all sorts of literature on the subject. Health food recipes, advice on losing weight. It is difficult to picture human beings' lifestyle any other way under the circumstance currently imposed impose by the technocratic will. The dark forces are constantly trying to take the natural operating system of this world, the one giving to humanity right from the start, and substitute their own cumberstone artificial system which goes against human nature. I ask Anastasia to put it in more concrete terms without her philo philo philosophical amusing. And she continued, You know, these questions of yours as to what, when, and how much a person should eat, they are best answered by the individual's own body. The sensations of hunger and thirst are designed to send a signal to each particular individual, indicating when he should take in food. This precise moment is the right one for each person. The world of technocracy being incapable of affording each individual the opportunity of satisfying his hunger and thirst at the moment desired by his body has tried to force him into its own schedule based on nothing but this world's own helplessness and that attempts to justify this composition in the name of some sort of efficiency. Just think, one person, one person spends half the day sitting down, expending hardly any energy, while another exerts himself with some kind of physical labor, or simply runs and perspires all over. 
thereby using up many times more energy. And yet both are expected to eat at exactly the same time. A person should take in food at the moment advised by his body. And there can be no other advisor. I realize that under your world's condition, this is practically impossible. But the opportunity does exist for people at their duchess with their attached garden plot. And they should take advantage of it and forget about their unnatural artificial regimes. The same applies to your second question. What should one eat? The answer is, whatever is available at the moment, whatever is on hand, so to speak, the body itself will select what it needs. I could offer you a bit of non-traditional advice. If you have a household pet like a cat or a dog, keep track of its movement carefully. Occasionally, it will find something in the way of grasses or herbs and eat it. You should tear off a few sample of whatever it selects and add it to your diet. This is not something you have to do every day. Once or twice a week is sufficient. You should, you should also take it upon yourself to gather some cereal grain, thresh it, grind it into flour, and then use the flour to make to bake bread. This is extremely important. Anyone consuming this bread even once or twice a year, will build up a store of energy capable of awakening his inner spiritual powers, not only calming his soul, but also exerting a beneficial influence on his physical condition. This bread can be shared with relatives and close friends. If shared with sincerity and love, it will have quite a beneficial influence on them as well. It is very helpful to every individual's health to spend three days at least once each summer only eating only what is grown in his garden plot along with bread, sunflower oil, and just a pinch of salt. I have already described Anastasia's own eating habits. While she was telling me all this, she would unwittingly tear off a blade of grass or two, put it in her mouth and chew it, and offer me some too. I decided to give it a try. I can't say the taste was anything to, to write home about, but neither did it provoke any sense of distaste. It seems as though Anastasia has left the whole task of nourishment and life support up to nature. She never allows it to interrupt her to interrupt her train of thought, which is always busy with some important, with some more important issues. Even so, her health is as remarkable as her outward beauty, of which it is an inseparable part. According to Anastasia, anyone who has established such a relationship with the earth and the plants on his own plot of land has the opportunity of ridding his body of absolutely every kind of disease. Disease per se is a result of man distancing, distancing himself from the natural system, designed to take care of his health and life support. For such systems, the task of counteracting any disease presents no problem whatsoever, since this is their whole reason for being. However, the benefits experienced by people who have set up such information exchange counteracts with a, lot, with a little patch of the natural world go far beyond dealing with disease. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 12 Sleeping Under One Stars I have already mentioned how animated Anastasia becomes when talking about plants and people who communicate with them. I thought that living in nature as she did, she might have studied nature alone, but she also possesses information about planetary relationships. She literally fills the celestial bodies. See for yourself what she has to say about sleeping under the stars. 
once plants have received information about a specific person, they embark upon an information exchange with cosmic forces. But here, they are simply intermediaries, carrying out a narrowly focused task involving one's fleshly body and certain emotional planes. They never touch the complex processes, which, out of all the animal and plant world on the planet, are inherent only in the human brain and on human planes of existence. Nevertheless, this information exchange they establish allows men to do what he alone can do. Namely, interact with the intelligence of the universe, or more precisely, to exchange information with this intelligence. An altogether simple procedure permits him not only to do this, but also to feel the beneficial effect of such interaction. Anastasia described this procedure as follows. Pick an evening when weather conditions are favor favorable and arrange to spend the night under the stars. You should situate your sleeping place close to raspberry or currant bushes or to beds where cereal seeds have been planted you should be there alone. As you lie with your face to the stars, do not close your eyes right away. Let your gaze physically and mentally wander across the celestial bodies. Do not become tense while thinking about them. Your thought must be free and uncucumbered. First, try to think about those celestial bodies which are visible to your eyes. Then you can dream about what you treasure in life, about the people closer to you, people for whom you wish only good. Do not attempt to even think at this point about seeking revenge or wishing evil upon anyone, for that might have a negative effect on you. This uncomplicated procedure will awaken some of the many little cells dormant in your brain, the vast majority of which Never wake, even once during a person's whole lifetime. The cosmic forces will be with you and help you attain the, re the realization of your brightest and most unimaginable dreams. Will help you find peace in your heart. Establish positive relationships with your loved ones and increase or call into being their love for you. It is useful to try repeating this procedure a number of times. It is effective only when carried out at the location of your constant contact with the planet world. And you will feel it yourself as early as the next morning. It is especially important to go through this procedure on the eve of your birthday to explain all this works would take too long right now and it is not important. Parts of the explanation you would not believe. Other parts you would not understand. It could be discussed much more quickly and easily with people who are already trying it 
and feeling its influence on themselves. Since the information once received and verified will, will facilitate the reception of any information that follows. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 13 A Helper and Mentor for Your Child And asking Anastasia how a plot of ground would seed plantings, even plantings carried out in the special manner, she described in maintaining close contact with men could facilitate the raising of children. I expected to hear an answer, something like, Children need to be imbued with a love of nature. However, I was wrong. What she actually said was amazing, both in its simplicity of argument and in the depth of its philosophical implications. Nature and the mind of the universe have seen to it that every new man is born a sovereign, a king, he is like an angel, pure and undefiled. Through the still soft upper part of his head, he takes in a huge flood of information from the universe. The abilities inherent in each newborn child are such as to allow him to become the wisest creature in the universe, godlike. It takes him very little time to bestow grace and happiness upon his parents. During this period, amounting to no more than nine earth years, he becomes aware of what constitutes creation and the meaning of human existence. And everything that he needs to accomplish this already exists. Only the parent should not distort the genuine natural structure of creation by cutting the child off from the most perfect works in the universe. The word of technocracy, however, does not allow parents to do the right thing. What does an infant see with its first conscious glance around? He sees the ceilings the edge of his crib, some patches of fabric, the walls, all attributes and values of the artificial world created by a technocratic society. And in this world, he finds his mother and her breasts. This must be the way things are, he concludes. His, smi his smiling parents offer him toys and other objects that rattle and squeak as though they were priceless treasures. Why? He will spend a long time trying to make sense of this rattling and squeaking. He will try to comprehend them both through his conscious mind and his subconscious. And then these same smiling parents will try wrapping him up in some kind of fabric, which he finds most uncomfortable. He will make attempts to free himself, but in vain. And the only means of protest he has at his disposal is a cry, a cry of protest, an appeal for help, a cry of rebellion. And from that moment on, this angel and sovereign becomes an indigent slave begging for hands out, one after another. The child is present with the accoutrements of an artificial world. He is rewarded for his acceptance by some new toy or item of clothing. And along with this, the thought is drumming to him that these are the dominant objects in the world where he has arrived. Still in his infancy, Despite his status as the most perfect being in the universe, he is pandered to and treated as an imperfect creature. 
even in those institutions you consider educational, where again, he is constantly remind, reminded of the values of this artificial world. Not until the age of nine does he hear a passing mention of the existence of the world of nature. And then only as an adjunct to that other, more important world of manufactured objects. And, mo and most people are never afforded the opportunity to become aware of the truth, even to the end of their days. And so it seems as though the simple question, what is the meaning of life, goes on answered. The meaning of life, that is to be found in truth, joy, and love. A nine-year-old child brought up in the natural world has a far more accurate perception of creation than all the scientific institutions of your world, or indeed many of your prominent scholars. Stop, Anastasia. You probably have in mind a knowledge of nature, assuming his life proceeds along the same lines as yours. Here I can agree with you, but think, today man's is obliged Rightly or wrongly, that is another question. But he is obliged to live specifically in our technocratic world, as you call it. Someone brought up as your pro someone brought up as you propose was certainly no nature, and have a feeling for it. But in everything else, he will be an utter ignoramus. Besides, there are other sciences like mathematics, physics, chemistry, or simply just knowing about life and its societal manifestations. For someone who has learnt at the right time about what constitutes creation, those things are mere trifles. If he wants or considers it necessary to prove himself in some scientific field, he will easily surpass all others. How could that happen so quickly? Man in the world of technocracy has never yet invented anything that is not already present in nature. Even the most perfect manufactured device are but a poor imitation of what exists in nature. Well, that may be, but you promised to explain how a child could be raised and his capabilities develop in our condition. I only talk about this in a way I can understand using concrete examples. I should try to be more concrete, replied Anastasia. I have already visualized and I have already visualized situation like this and have tried to hint to one family what they should do. Only there was no way they could have grasped the cru crucial point and asked their child the proper questions. These parents turn out to have an unusual, pure, talented child who could have brought tremendous benefit to people living on earth. So these parents arrive with this three-year-old child at their dacha plot and bring along his favorite toys. Artificial toys, toys which displace the true priorities of the universe. Oh. If only they had not done that, just think, the child could have been occupied and entertained with something far more interesting than senseless and even harmful interaction with manufactured objects. First of all, you should ask him to help you. Only ask him in all seriousness without any pandering, especially since he will actually be able to offer your, you assistance. If you do any planting, for example, ask him to hold the seeds in preparation for sowing, or take out the seed beds, or have him put a seed into the hole you have prepared. And in the process, talk to him about what you were doing. Something like this. We will be putting the little seed into the ground and covering it with earth. When the sun in the sky shines and warms the earth, the little seed will get warm and start to grow. It will want to see the sun, and the little shoot will poke its head out of the earth, just like this one. At this point, you can show him some little blades of glass. 
If the seeds likes the sunshine, it will grow bigger and bigger and maybe turn into a tree or something smaller like a flower. And I wanted to bring you tasty fruit and you will eat it if you like it. The little shoot will prepare its fruit for you. Whenever you arrive with your child at the dacha plot or when he awakes first thing in the morning, have him look and see whether any shoots have come up. If you should notice one, show your delight, even when you are putting young plants, rather than seeds into the ground. It is important to explain to your child what you are doing. If you are planting tomato seedlings, for example, let him hand you the stalks one by one. If a stalk should inadvertently break, take the broken stalk into your hands and say, I do not think this one is a, will live or bear fruit since it is broken. But broken, but let us try planting it anyway and plant at least one of the broken ones right along with the others. A few days later, when you visit the seed bed again with your child and the stalks have firm up, point out the broken withering stalk to your little one and remind him that it was broken during the planting. But do not use any preaching tone of voice in doing so. You need to talk with him as an equal. You should bear in mind the thought that he is superior to you in some respects. In the purity of his thought, for example, he is an angel. If you succeed in understanding that, you can then proceed intuitively and your child will indeed become a person who will happy fire your days. Whenever you sleep under the stars, take your child with you. Lay him down beside you. Let him look at the stars. But under nurse, no circumstance, tell him the names of the planets or how you perceive their origin and function. Since this is something you do not really know yourself. And the fear is stored in your brain will only lead the child astray from the truth. His subconscious knows the truth and it will penetrate his consciousness all by itself. All you need to do is to tell him that you like looking at the shining stars and ask your child which star he likes best of all. In general, it is very important to know how to ask your child questions. The next year, you can offer your child his own seed bed. Fix it up and give him the freedom to do whatever he likes with it. Do not ever compel him by force to do anything with it. And do not correct, correct what he has done. You can simply ask him what he likes. You can offer help, but only after asking his permission to work along with him. When you are planting cereal grains, have him throw some grains on the seed bed for you. Okay, I remarked to um, Anastasia, still not fully convinced. Maybe a child like this will show interest in the plant world. Maybe he'll become a good agronomist. But where is he going to get knowledge from in other areas? What do you mean we're from? It is not just a matter of having a knowledge and feeling about what grows and how. The main thing is that the child is starting to think, analyze, and cells are awakening in his brain, which will operate throughout his life. They will make him brighter and more talented compared to those whose corresponding cells are still dormant. dormant. As far as civilized life goes, what you call progress, he may well turn out to be superior in any field of endeavor. All the more so since the purity of his thought will make him an exceptional happy person. The contact he has established with his plants will allow him to constantly take in and exchange more and more information. The incoming messages will be received by his subconscious and transmit it to his consciousness in the form of many new thoughts and discoveries. discoveries. Outwardly, he will look like everyone else, but inwardly, this is the kind of man you call a genius. <laughs>